remember it clearly. It was August 18th, 1999, the date of the double Grand Cross planetary alignment. And out of nowhere, I was moved by a compulsion to find my old Lenormand deck, right? And draw the third card, specifically. Because three is a magic number. But this took longer than I expected. Because apparently I didn't put my Lenormand deck back in the cabinet with my other divination tools. Instead, I'd file it away on a bookshelf between two unrelated books, right? Philip Sudkin's The Complete History of Jack the Ripper and Medieval Heresy by Malcolm Lambert. The card was card number 10, the Jack of Diamonds, right? The Scythe, a card of warning and irreversible decisions. While I sat and pondered its possible meanings for hours, even wondering if its placement on the bookshelves between a book about Jack the Ripper and another one about heresy had any significance. Two weeks later, my friend Frederick came by. He saw the card and said, Oh, Le Faux. And when I asked him to explain, he told me that Le Faux is the French word for the scythe. But he only knew that because of this weird Belgian album that had a song on it called Le Faux. And when I asked him for details about it, man shivers all up and down my spine because he told me it was by a band called universe zero the album was called heresy and it had songs on it called lafoe and jack the ripper and man i sprinted out of the house to get that album once again this week's request comes from someone i was unable to contact for follow-up information so I'm having to make up their stories out of whole cloth, in case you couldn't tell. And to the requester, my made-up stories are mostly an attempt at humor. No offense is intended, I assure you. And the request I received was for Heresy by Universe Zero. Everything I know about Universe Zero I learned during my week of listening to Henry Cow for episode 61 in season 3. What I learned at that time was that they participated in the Rock in Opposition Festival along with Henry Cow, Stormy Six, Salma Mama's Mana, and Etron Foulet Loblon. And I know that they're from Belgium. But when I was clipping video to include in episode 61 to show examples of each of those bands, it was the sound of Universe Zero that intrigued me the most. So I made a point to include this album in my list of all of the suggestions I received, despite the fact that I couldn't contact the person who requested it. Sure hope you're okay, requester. Doing just a small amount of reading ahead of time, I see that Universe Zero started off as a Zool band. <laughs> and that their original band name was Necronomicon. Legend has it that it was written by the Dark Ones. Necronomicon Ex Mortis. And the term Zool, Zehul, apparently comes from the French sci-fi prog band Magma. According to what I was able to find out, Zool is the Kobayan word for cosmic, and Kobayan is the made-up language invented by Christian Vander, specifically for writing magma songs. I also see that there's an episode of the Romantic Warriors documentary series that deals specifically with the rock in opposition bands, so I'll need to check that out as well. Also interestingly, it looks like this album is almost entirely acoustic. The instrumentation seems to be guitar, piano, organ, Harmonium, upright bass, oboe, bassoon, violin, viola, drums, and percussion. And finally, according to YouTube user arnob.7669, Nice. This is one of the darkest, all caps, albums ever made. So perfect for driving home after Thanksgiving. Well, I guess I'm off to embrace the darkness. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's more from our anonymous requester, as reinterpreted by the forces which govern my immeasurably discombobulated subconscious. I didn't know what to make of it at first. I listened to it nonstop for most of the weekend, but didn't understand what I was hearing. I was definitely missing something. But I knew that I'd been led to this album. I knew it was important for me to get my wavelengths aligned with the energy coming from heresy. So to help me become more receptive to it, I put it away for a while and I meditated in silence, right? Hoping to get my childlike mind, right? And hear the music within its own domain. But that didn't work at first either. Though it did have the effect of imprinting some of the energy of the music onto my aura. Because I started dreaming about it. Then I decided to get a French dictionary and look up the meaning of that one phrase, right? Vous le saurez en temps volu. 
the only song that hadn't been part of the synchronicity event that led me to the album in the first place. When I realized it meant you'll know it in due course, well, what else could I do but laugh? If Stanley Kubrick had made a film based on At the Mountains of Madness, this is the music you would have used. It's definitely got that sound of 20th century classical music, that feel of bleakness mixed with the uncanny valley feeling that you get from extensive use of non-diatonic, even sometimes 12-tone harmonic structures. Mostly who I'm reminded of is Bela Bartok. And to a lesser extent, some of his acolytes like Grigori Ligeti. Or maybe Vitold Ludislavsky. His darker bits, anyway. I don't see Universe Zero releasing an album of tangos and foxtrots under an assumed name like Ludislavsky did for his Dervid periods. But that 20th century classical feel, that only describes part of it. Because Universe Zero very much has a rock rhythm section of bass and drums. And both instruments are featured prominently. So in that sense, the three songs on Heresy feel very much like chamber music for rock band. Maybe think of it like this. Universe Zero are to Bartok as the Dixie Dregs are to, say, Vivaldi. La Faux is a 25-minute long, full album-side suite and has definite sections throughout, right? But they're not named and delineated as they might have been if Robert Fripp had written it. Starts in free time with these long-held note clusters by the melodic instruments over rattles and cymbal scrapes. It reminds me in some ways of some of the things that we used to do in the Yeti trio early on, with Eric banging cymbals against the wall and dropping lengths of chain onto his drum heads. And after that builds for a while, with the rhythmic component becoming increasingly more involved, the drums suddenly drop away, and then the creepy chanting starts. Gotta have creepy chanting. <laughs> Then we get to the truly monstrous bit that marks the end of that first movement. Monstrous in that it literally sounds like a monster. One more build up and then we get a bassoon, which brings us into the next section, a repeated figure played beneath the bassoon melody. And this develops into quite nearly typical song structure, with the rhythm section playing more or less a traditional rock groove. Sure, it's in 5-4. And sure, the bass line is loaded with tritones and flat nines, but still, rock, kinda. Once the groove ends, the bassoon again starts the next section. Much more dirgy this time, though, but still in 5-4. This settles into a building little groove for quite a while, when suddenly... Well, that's one way to transition. Another last groove in 5-4. Much more urgent. And this switches to halftime after a minute or so, and stays there through some pretty interesting changes in feel over the next five minutes or so, right to the end of the album side. Side two starts with Vous les saurez en temps volu, which means you will know in due time. And I'm thinking that the name has to be something of a pun, or at least as close to humor as you're likely to get on this album, because the main motif for a good portion of the song is shifting or otherwise difficult time signatures. <music> Offset with long stretches of common time. Largo. Very ponderous. But the one thing from this song that you're likely to come away with is this catchy little banger of a bass line. And the last song, Jack the Ripper. When it started, I actually had to take a minute 
The previous 45 minutes of music had pulled me so far away from traditional notions of diatonic music that I couldn't tell at first whether the last note on that opening ostinato was a tritone or a perfect fifth. It's a tritone. I mean, of course it is. The song builds on that bass line for quite a while, but about five minutes in, we get to the most adventurous use of odd meter on the album, when they switch to 11-8. And after a bit, 13-8. And even something that was very clearly improvised. A bit of bowed upright bass solo, with the band responding very much like a jazz band would in this context. <laughs> then a dead stop and a rebuild for the last stretch of the album, ending like this. First couple of spins of the album. Well, I can tell you for sure that this is not music I'm throwing on in the car on the way home from work on a Friday to try and get a mood going. <laughs> but by the same measure, I can also tell you that this album will be pretty near the top of my list when I'm trying to illustrate to friends what I mean by eclectic taste in music. It also might be fun to introduce it to some of my friends who are into that darker side of metal. But also right away, I can tell you that this music is extraordinarily complex. I wasn't joking when I said it reminded me of Bartok. This music warrants study. In fact, I think study might be the best method for approaching heresy in general. So I'm off to study. I'll be right back with some more thoughts right after these words from my made-up version of our requester. Because look, man, heresy isn't music that contains a secret. Heresy is music that describes a feeling of having a secret. It's not a cult. It's not hidden. It's the frame around it. And that all by itself is a kind of hidden knowledge, dig? Because your mind invents things to fill in the blanks of something that's hidden. But most of the time when you find out what it is, it never matches the depth of meaning that you had imposed on it before you knew what it was. So it struck me then, right, that the space between what you imagine and what it is, that's the true nature of the occult, right? And the real irony, like the true irony, is that it took something unexplainable to illuminate this simple truth. Still not sure what that's supposed to mean. Man, I wonder what Frederick's up to these days. You know, whether or not I eventually become a UZ stan, I have to say I'm really starting to appreciate the whole notion of rock and opposition in general. I mean... I don't see myself learning the Kobayan language or tracking down rare live recordings of Art Zoid or anything, but watching the Rock in Opposition episode of Romantic Warriors gave me a lot to think about. If the primary motive behind rock and roll as a cultural phenomenon was the idea that you should be able to express yourself freely, throwing off the notion that music has to be made a certain way, then it makes all the sense in the world that there would be as many different kinds of rock music as there are people who feel compelled to express themselves in that setting. But ultimately, that's not what happened. The music that appeals to the largest number becomes pop, and the music that appeals to the second largest population becomes some form of non-pop. Call it punk or alternative, or whatever word means the closest to shut up mom, you don't understand me at that particular moment in time. And in the mid-50s, the name given to non-pop just happened to be rock and roll. Then, the people making pop music get to not care about how anything else is made, because why would they? And the people making non-pop music get to dictate to real music lovers what music is supposed to be. And what music is supposed to be, invariably, is the stylistic delta between pop and non-pop, with a thousand rationalizations as to why theirs is better, purer, more meaningful, whatever. And all the while, the same handful of media companies get to sell you both of them. Meanwhile, there are folks, like me, who know for certain that they don't fit into either one. I mean, I don't want music specifically engineered to appeal to a lowest common denominator. And I don't want music whose primary artistic impulse is to point at the popular kid and say, I'm whatever that guy hates. And this explains the impetus behind rock in opposition. This kind of false dichotomy is precisely what they were opposing. 
And of course, all of this is extremely oversimplified, but nonetheless does, from my understanding, reflect the way that a good portion of music fans feel, especially those who are drawn to bands like Universe Zero. And you know, I really like the notion that you can get a small band together and really dig into something that appeals to you, regardless of how popular the result might be. Whether it's deconstructing Howlin' Wolf like Captain Beefheart, adding angst to James Brown like Talking Heads, or exploring the tonal vocabulary of 20th century classical music like Universe Zero. But for me personally, I mean, I occasionally get into moods where I am looking specifically for cinematic music, and I'll end up spending a day listening to the soundtrack to The Conversation by David Shire. Or Bernard Herrmann scored a Hitchcock's Vertigo. And I think this is where heresy is going to be for me. It feels cinematic. Dark, yes, but still primarily cinematic. Which entirely fits, since even the members of Universe Zero stated that they drew primary inspiration for La Faux from Berkman's Seventh Seal. They may do. Yeah, I didn't. So my final thoughts. On a scale of 1 to 10, I give Heresy by Universe Zero one runic warning carved into the south face of an ancient willow, which marks the boundary between the depths of the forest and the realm of nether beings who delight in slowly corrupting the minds of foolish humans whose arrogance and hubris drive them to venture too far into the unknown when they have been warned repeatedly to stay on the trail. See you next week! Thank <laughs> you.